Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, generally, I don't get to speak on the webcast very much. It's normally the SANS instructors, but uh, today is a special day because we're introducing the new SANS pen test poster, Pivots and Payloads of Board Game. Uh, my guest with me today are Ed Scotus and McDouglas, who are the SANS instructors here. Uh, they're the ones that were able to give all the technical information that they'll cover today. I'm more of the uh, pretty and functional, and they are more of the technical and learning. Uh, so, Ed, welcome. Mick, welcome. Hey, thank you. Good to be here. Yeah. So, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Mick, I don't know if you're on mute, but just in case. This is the poster. Uh, this right here. Uh, this is the front of the poster we like to call the board game. Uh, it's called Pivots and Payloads. We were trying to come up with a name that was uh, pen test like, but also Candyland, you know, shoots and ladders like, so that way it was easy to remember. So we came up with the pivots and payloads, and I, I would send you know names and things to Ed, and I think Ed, we finally uh, settled in, on this one, right? Yeah, we did. I um I remember you originally had Hackerland, which was kind of neat, but it sounded a little too much like Candyland to me. So I said, hey, about something else. And then you came up with the idea of shoots and ladders. I really love the just overall look of this thing. The thing that I think is the coolest, um, not only all the great technical information, I mean, that's the coolest part, but I love the and sign in between pivots and payloads. Mm -hmm. It's very high tech, almost looks kind of like an X, but shows the crisscross kind of thing. That's neat. I also love how everything's wired together so people can see it from game start, it's all wired in uh, and goes all the way around so you can kind of see the flow of the game as you move your way up, all the way to achievement unlocked. And it's as you're working your way through the pen test. I do notice that the colors of the wire change uh, as, you, as you move your way up, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, and the, the wires that go into the Achievement Unlocked and the, the Game Start, we we uh, we looked and made sure that that's the way that Cat5 cables are supposed to be. That's um, awesome. I was yeah, hoping I, you did. I didn't want to ask, but I was hoping <laughs> you did. I just had this feeling that somebody would be sitting in their office with it up on the wall, and they go, you know, that's not the right order. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is that we wanted to make sure that people thought this was a board game. Uh, it's, it's a functional board game. You can absolutely cut out the pieces. You can cut out the game modifiers. You can lay it on a table. You can roll a, a D6 dice and you can play this game. And uh, it's a lot of fun to actually play it. Or you can have it on your wall and, and people can take a look at it and just learn. I, and test I do out. have a question. I, I hope it's an okay question. Huh? I I don't know, you know, but yeah. I'm sure some of the, the audience is thinking this, so I might as well ask it of you, Jason. Can, you can play this, like you say, put it on your desk or something like that, and you can play it or hang it on the wall, but can you do this like Twister style too? Is that is that an option? You know, uh, didn't we have the, the idea of like printing this out to where it was gigantic at a SANS conference so you could stand on the pieces? That's right, kind of like one of those big chess boards, right, that uh, is yeah. you know, over a certain space. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's probably better than Twister, yeah. For the people listening right now, if you want us to print this out, you know, 100 foot by 100 foot and just lay it on the conference room floor, uh, just let us know. All right. <laughs> yeah, let us know. <laughs> and we'll ship it to you. No, no, we won't. Well, right. you have to pay shipping for that. <laughs> so, Where did um, that idea come from, Jason? How did, how did this, this wonderful it, kind of fun and whimsical notion come about? Well, uh, what happened was, you know, I, I'm always thinking of, I'm not the technical guy on the team. You know, I'm the one that's like trying to figure this stuff out. I still learn about pen testing through listening to you and the webcast that we do. And so I was just trying to figure out if I was going to explain penetration testing to a person who's never heard it before, was there a way that I could do it by going through the phases? Could I show that the defenders could do things that could stop, you know, an attacker? And one day I was just like, oh, a board game. Like a board game could do that to where as you're going through, if you landed on something that the defense could do, that would push you back or it would send you back to start or it would hinder your uh, your advancement. Um, and, and so, you know, since I'm the people person on the team, like, you know, I'm the people person that takes the technical stuff and can relate it to people. And I came out with a board game. Someone pointed out the other day that I'm the guy from Office Space. So I'm the jump to conclusions guy. I there you go. Have, uh, I, I think officially I was, arrived. when you first pitched this to me, you said, I've got an idea. It's board game, board game. And I'm like, B O R E D, board game? I, no. <laughs> You're like, no, 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 not that. A board game. Like you roll dice yeah. and move. Oh. Uh, so, 
So this is the original picture I sent to Ed. And uh, he's like, yeah. And then it took a long time to f actually figure out what it was going to look like. But then uh, Mick Douglas showed up. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a few seconds. Uh, but the back. So I understand that some people don't really, uh, that may not want to put the board game up or they want to put up both sides. The back of it kind of dives into some of the other aspects of uh, the board game itself. So it's, there's some reconnaissance here. It talks about Shodan and some ways to use Shodan better. And the reason why we put that on there is because the Shodan uh, blog on the Pentest blog is one of the most trafficked uh, blog sites all year long. So uh, we have a blog called How to Get the, you know, the Most Out of Shodan, and people just look at that all the time. So we put that information on there. Ed, how often do you and your team use Shodan? Oh, all the time. I mean, you know, any, any pen test we do, it's not like a product-oriented pen test. But even then, sometimes for a product-oriented pen test, because you want to see if the product is on the internet, right? So, uh, yeah, Shodan's very, very useful recon tool and for locating very unusual widgets connected to the internet. Yeah. Yeah. For the level of effort that it takes to do Shodan, why wouldn't you? You know, right. you have to use it. It's just low-hanging fruit. And then uh, Google Dorks. So, um you know, OSINT and Google Dorks all kind of come together for that reconnaissance piece. And I didn't know much about Google Dorks, and I, I'm not sure how many other people know about Google Dorks. So either I was the only person that didn't really know about it, or it was something that's put on this poster to remind people that this exists and they can use it during the reconnaissance. Um, and so I reached out to some other people, but Mick, how often do you use Google Dorks in a uh, pen test? all the time. Not only do I use it actively, I actually have passive Google alerts set up for certain conditions. So there's all kinds of things that you can find from uh, Google dorking. Um, probably the coolest thing I've ever found on a pen test was a client's closed circuit camera system was connected directly to the internet using default credentials. And during the physical portion of the pen test, we were able to actually watch the security guards as they were doing their rounds, and we were able to instruct somebody to hide when they came nearby. That's like from a TV show, right? You got the people on the computer sending little messages in. Hide now, they're gonna see you, they're gonna see you. That's yeah, really cool. It felt like a, a spy novel or, or something yeah. that was crazy. Nice. <laughs> it's stories like that that just, like pen testing and physical pen testing has just gotta be like the coolest job sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it's so much fun, it's crazy. Uh, so just to dive into some of the other aspects of the poster. So if you take the front and the back together, when you cut out the game pieces, uh, each game piece goes with a course. Uh, and so the X-ray specs is a part of the 460, the Enterprise Threat and Vulnerability Assessment course. Um, the you know, laptop goes with the 504 course, slingshot with the 560 course, you know, when you flip them around and, and cut them out. I think my favorite one on here is King Arthur's Rabbit, because uh, that goes with the 573, the Python uh, course, the automating information security with Python. And uh, that came about because you know, Python's based on Monty Python, and we were trying to find what would make a great game piece. And uh, the graphic designer, she's, you know, she all the time actually refers to Monty Python. And so I was like, hey, I want you to make King Arthur's Rabbit. And you should have seen the smile on her face. I'm like, <gasps> I get to do that? Yes, you do. So. Um, Ed, do you have any um, anything or Mick, anything to chime in on this part here? Well, for those of you who are looking at this and saying, wait a second, um, if you look at King Arthur's Rabbit, it's supposed to be associated with 573, but if you look at the other side, you see it's like across from it. Remember, this is the front and back, so it's kind of like a mirror image kind of thing. So this does actually line up. When you cut it on the poster, I, I tested it. Um, it lines up so that you get those different uh, game pieces. And they're very clever game pieces. I love the kind of tie-in. You got your your magic wand, which kind of goes with Sans most, uh, you know, technically sophisticated and complex course 760. Um, you know, you got your spider uh, associated with 542. It's just really cool the way they line up. Oh, and one other really cool thing was um, you know, about three months before we were able to print and finish the poster, uh, I put out on Twitter, if you were going to play a board game based on penetration testing, what game piece would you want to be? And some of these are directly related to the, uh, the feedback that we got from those, those people on Twitter. So thank you very much to the people who contributed to making sure that this looked pretty cool. 
My favorite contribution was the people who suggested an energy drink, because while pen testing is a lot of fun, it is very tedious, and sometimes the hours are rough. So energy drink for the win. Yeah. I mean, one day there could be a net worth energy drink. I just, I mean, we already have the packaging ready to go. <laughs> well, we'd have to make sure it tastes good. <laughs> and then this part right here, the game modifiers, uh, you know, I've played the game itself, and you can use these to to um, get through the game better or to um, mess with your opponents. But all of these game modifiers are based on the, the community aspects of what we do in the Pentest curriculum. So everything from Bill Drone, Pentest Lab, that was a webcast given from Jeff McJunkin a while ago, but it's still incredibly useful. Uh, the Rita Sands Pentest blog, you know, that's the link right there. If you, if you download the PDF, you can just click on these links and it'll take you directly to these these different sections. And then, Ed, we have the uh, Play the Sands Holiday Hack Challenge. And for the people who have never played that, could you kind of give an overview of what that is? Sure. For the last uh, 15 plus years, uh, we have created a series of holiday themed hacker challenges. Uh, some of them are offensive, some of them are defensive, some of them are digital forensics, analytics. They're all skills that you'd use in real world cybersecurity work. And uh, they've grown in sophistication and complexity over the years. Uh, starting around uh, three years ago, uh, we released a video game world with it. So you kind of explore the world and it became social so you could work with other people. We also had a soundtrack for that one. And uh, we just released this year's. Um, and this year's it has an associated online virtual conference. So the idea here is Santa Claus wanted to host a conference at the North Pole. So we had uh, 22 speakers, I mean, 22 of the best speakers in the industry, including Mick Douglas, um, lots of other folks like John Strand and uh, Deviant Olaf and uh, a whole bunch of other folks uh, presented at this thing. And you can go to holidayhackchallenge.com. You can register there for free. It's entirely free. We give it away. And then you get access to KringleCon, where you can see the talks, talk with your fellow players, but also you can solve hacking challenges there. And uh, as you do, a little story unfolds. There's something happening happening inside of Santa's castle. Um, so that's what we've done, and I'm really happy with this year's. The music is my favorite part of the whole thing, um, but I think people are also going to love the hacking challenges and the video game piece. So Ed, I have a question for you. When does KringleCon go offline? We leave them up always. So I actually pay out of my own pocket for this, but uh, all the holiday hacks run in perpetuity. Uh, if you want to play Holiday Hack Challenge 2014, you can. It's online. 2015, 17, 16, 18, whatever. We leave them online all the time. That way, if you're like sitting in July and you've got some spare time, maybe you're on vacation or holiday or something like that, and you got a day or two and you want to build your skills or have some fun, go on to Holiday Hack Challenge 2016. We post all of the answers for the old ones. So they're there, and you can just kind of work your way through. The, the goal of this is to have some fun, but also to learn. And if we were to take it offline, people wouldn't be able to learn from it because it'd be offline. So we leave them on always, all of them. And then uh, for everyone listening, I, I just want to point out that if you see the SANS Pentest webcast, we do have a YouTube channel and the link is right there and you can see it. If uh, We have uh, 102 uh, webcasts available on the SANS Pentest. And these also include videos from uh, SANS instructors who presented at conferences. So we've put them all together in, in one place so that you can listen and learn and watch uh, whenever you want to. So there is a ton, ton of content out there on everything from post-exploitation to starting your very first OSINT investigation. There is just so much information available to help you learn, and it's all there for free on our YouTube channel. So Mick, um, so Mick Douglas came in and I was like, Mick, I have all these uh, landing spaces that I need to fill with you know, wonderful information on, on everything from on how to do a penetration test. And so I think, Mick, you took about three or four days. You went back and you filled in all these. And so if I could get you to just maybe pick one out as we go through each of these and teach somebody something in each one of these phases so that way, uh, we can fulfill the SANS promise that at the end of this webcast, they'll be able to take something from uh, today's webcast and apply immediately to their job. Sure, I'd be happy to. And also, thanks for thinking of me when it came to this phase of this. 
Um, for those of you who don't know, it was rather daunting when Jason came to me because there were all these blank spaces and some of them had little hints like something cool goes here. And I was like, ah, I don't know. What am I going to put here? So um, we're, we're glad that we were able to come up with something that I hope you will agree is kind of interesting. So one thing that I like to focus on the scoping and rules of engagement for a pen test is the third square right there. The target organization gives you your victory conditions. Folks, if you're doing pen testing and you stop when you get domain admin, you're doing it wrong. You need to go so much further. You actually need to show business impact because if somebody goes to senior management or the executives or the board of directors and shows up and says, we got domain admin, mic drop. They don't care. There's no meaningful, uh, no interest there because it's what you do afterwards that counts. Ed, what's your take on that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, one of the, the phrases applied to this uh, first came from Josh Abraham called it goal-oriented pen testing. And your goal should not be a technical goal. Your goal should be business-oriented, showing some business risk is meaningful. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to properly prioritize resources for fixing it after the fact. So you got to start out on the right foot with this and have a business goal, a business risk that you're measuring for. What kind of threat could cause what kind of risk for this business? Because that will give you the justification for fixing it. Otherwise, hey, bad guy got domain admin. Wow, that sounds horrible. We should fix it. Yeah, but we don't want to spend a lot of money fixing it. Okay. Whereas bad guy got domain admin, and because of that, he exfiltrated these secrets, which then is going to bring all kinds of compliance requirements and government regulatory scrutiny on us, which is going to cost us thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to deal with. Oh, oh, fix that now. So you're, you're spot on, Mick. you got to do that right up front. And don't think that it just needs to be data exfiltration. A lot of times attackers are doing fraud. So maybe have the pen test victory condition be inserting things into a database or approving a transaction. Now, if your client balks at that, if they're scared that you're going to actually cause problems, that's okay. Offer to do the work in a non-production environment that replicates prod. You don't have to do everything live, but you do have to show that there's impacts of the vulnerabilities and the misconfigurations because otherwise they run tools and they say, oh, this is critical. Well, what's what's in it, you know? So actually showing what the impact of these findings are is really where it's at. So right. in my opinion, when you get domain admin, your work on a, as a pen tester really has just started. Well said. So I was on mute, uh, but when I was playing the game for the very first time when the prototype came in, I rolled a one uh, on my first and I landed on scoping call, went great. And I was like, oh, cool, like, here we go. And then I rolled a three and client wants to modify scope and I had to go back to start. And I was like, ah, great. <laughs> you know how it feels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, moving on, reconnaissance, Mick. Yes, this is my favorite phase and one of the things that I uh, want to uh, dive in on is the showdown. I, I can't overstate how much easier it is to do reconnaissance over the last couple of years. We now have more and more resources available to us. And yet I'm not seeing many organizations, pen test organizations, utilize all the OSINT or open source intelligence that's available to them. And resources like Shodan.io is a great resource to start interacting with. And one of the things that's uh, really quite sobering is how often I will use a resource like Shodan and say, show me all the systems that are in the IP address block that belongs to my client organization. And I'll find devices that are connected to their DMZ that they don't know about. And this is the kind of thing that's a very easy task to do, but if they don't know about this host, it's most likely not being controlled under configuration management. It's not being patched. Now, that might not be the case, but it's at least worth checking out as an adversary 
when I'm emulating the bad guys, I'm not trying to go against the hardest system in the network. I'm trying to find the easiest target and use that as a jumping off point. And with reconnaissance, if you do it right, if you do it well, you're going to be that sniper that's shooting one, at one attack versus the script kitty that's spraying and praying and seeing what sticks. If you're doing the spray and pray, it's going to take forever and you're going to have a low probability of success. Reconnaissance, it's where it's at. Ed, do you have any uh, follow-ups with that before we move on? No, no, I think uh, Mick handled that very nicely. Beautiful. Okay. So scanning. Mick, uh, which one on this would you like to talk about? Well, um, let's spend some time talking about the verification of findings. Um, so that middle bullet point there, or, or the middle square, um, one of the things that I think that um, if I could wave a magic wand in the industry, one of the things that I'm starting to see is that people will get the results of a tool. So like say they're doing search engine recon, maybe they're using something like um, Recon NG that helps facilitate searches with the, the search tools, or maybe they're using FOCA, which helps with doing um, uh, file analysis, right? You still need to validate what your tools show. And part of the reason for that is there's going to be a lot of false findings. And it's up to you as a pen tester to actually bring that value add to say, hey, we ran the scanning tool, we ran an Nmap scan, or we ran Nessus. All are fine products. Every single tool that I've mentioned so far are great tools. But what, it's, what you need to do is validate what came back because maybe it's a honeypot. Maybe there's a firewall configured in a way that's giving you mixed results. So you have to actually interact and do things largely by hand, which unfortunately does take time but it's time well spent because what you're doing is you're making that investment on your reconnaissance pay off and pay very big dividends. That's right. And I mean, really it's, it's all about providing more business value. Um, if you just turn over what your automated tool says, you yourself can be automated, right? You're not doing very much of a job. You got to provide that business value by vetting and validating the findings. You want to eliminate false positives where you can because that's just going to waste time and energy of somebody trying to find something or fix something that is not really a problem. Um, and we do talk in the various SANS classes. I know we do this a lot in, in the 560 class, for example, about different tools and techniques you can use to manually interact with target systems. Tools like Netcat, which I think we're going to talk about a little bit more later. Uh, tools like Scapy for packet crafting. Um, and a lot of the other SANS classes do this as well, including things like 573, the, the Python uh, or InfoSec Professionals class, using Python to interact with targets in a lot of different ways. Um, but yeah, you got to verify those findings or else you're wasting time and money and you're risking yourself being replaced by just an automated script. So when I was playing the game, I kept landing on the go back two spaces and skip next turn. And I kept just it was difficult to make my way through because there were so many things to land on that would set me back. And all of a sudden I go, oh, this is what Ed and Mick talk about in a pen test where you just keep running up against stuff and you have to find ways around that. Yeah, one thing that a lot of people uh, mistakenly believe is that as an attacker, it's easy. You know, they'll say you only need one way in. And while that's true, it's finding that one way that can take days or weeks. So the, the um, negative, uh, sl uh, negative uh, spots were deliberate choices because this phase can be very frustrating. And usually when I'm having a, on a pen test, if I'm experiencing difficulties in the scanning phase, that usually means I haven't done a good enough job of reconnaissance. Hmm. All right, moving on. Uh, password attacks. So I love doing password attacks. Uh, quite frankly, if you can steal somebody's password hash and crack it, you can log in as them. And there's nothing like unauthorized, authorized access. It gets very tricky for the defenders. And one of the things that I wanna spend some time is talking about Hashcat 
Uh, Jason, we've got a, a, a bonus uh, element on the back of the poster about Hashcat. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, so we, for the first time, we put together a Hashcat cheat sheet. So it's available on the poster. And then uh, we have a blog that's coming that will be more in depth because we couldn't fit everything that we wanted to in to the printed poster. So we're going to have a, um, additional material available on the blog site. And this is coming from John Gornflow, who did a webcast on this that we'll talk about about three or four slides from now. Yep, I want to give a special shout out to him. He's, uh, while not one of the authors, he is one of the people who helped uh, troubleshoot and uh, tech edit this game. So thanks, John. All right. Uh, add anything to uh, follow up with maybe some of the things that you talk about in 560? Oh, sure. We do uh, really some cool stuff with Hashcat in 560. Um, it's a relatively new lab I uh, added about six months ago. And the interesting thing is, you know, if you use John the Ripper, John does a great job at doing word mangling based on usernames as well as your dictionary. Um, so what we do is we show how you can use Hashcat and also certain specific word lists with certain rules, so it'll do similar username word mangling in creating possible password guesses. I think it's one of the, the most fun and interesting labs because you're trying to kind of think about how a human might take a word and convert it into a password, and mimicking that properly will help you crack passwords more quickly. Um, there's a lot of interesting research going on on that, including uh, some folks that are looking at machine learning uh, exposing that to a whole bunch of different passwords that have been breached so that then you can use uh, a trained neural network to spit out potential other passwords that users might have formulated. It's really a fascinating area and I, I love it and uh, you know we talk about Hashcat and how to use it to formulate those potential password guesses when cracking. All right. So Mick, we have exploitation. Yep, this is the fun phase. Everybody wants to jump immediately to it. And um, what I would uh, like to talk about a little bit is the misconfigured service, no exploit required. One of the things that um, people are kind of shocked to learn when they first get into pen testing is that while it's all well and good to create malware or take off the shelf malware and twist it so that it avoids uh, IDS and antivirus, things like that, um, one of the the more unsettling truths when it comes to doing penetration testing is I like to do more living off the land style attacks where you use existing systems against themselves. And in most instances, if you look across an organization, there's usually one or two machines that have a misconfiguration or they're missing a patch and you're able to exploit that system without sending any malware. All you're doing is interacting with that system like a normal user would, and then at a certain key juncture, you just tip it a little differently. Maybe you give a different command line argument or write a file into a directory at, at a key moment. And now you're using that system and you're abusing that system in a way that the designers of that machine never anticipated. And that's so, just, that's a, just yeah. a wonderful way to hack. I love it. And yeah, and you're, one of the things that I wanted to actually kind of guide you on, Ed, is in 504 and 560, there's some sections where you use the OS core functions against them. Could you talk about that? Absolutely. Living off the land is what I like to call it and a lot of other people do as well, um, using the built-in features of the operating system to attack that system as well as other machines in the environment. And um, also especially using administrative functions um, and even administrative style functions that you don't require administrative privileges to use. It's just, it's, a, it's an elegant and, and pretty way to hack. It's also less likely to be noticed because you're not installing all these separate tools in the environment. And uh, there's my office chiming at the top of the hour. Um, living off the land uh, by uh, calling uh, Westminster chimes. But, uh, but anyway, it is a really, really useful um, technique. And I'm glad that it's, it's covered here in this poster. Yeah. All right, moving on to pivoting. And so uh, could you give us an overview of what pivoting is and your favorite thing on here? So 
pivoting is the process by which once an attacker gets on a system, they've got a beachhead in your environment, what they're going to be doing is looking for other machines to interact with. And usually what they're trying to do at this phase is go from a low trust zone, say a DMZ, and move into a higher trust network, like maybe the, I don't know, like the database network. So you go uh, compromise the web server and because the web server and the database server are allowed to chat with one another, what you as the attacker will try to do is take advantage of those pre-existing rules in the firewall that allow that interaction to take place. And you can basically proxy from the web server into the database uh, network. And one of the things that people don't understand is that this is actually one of the easiest phases of the attack lifecycle to stop and to just kill dead. And the way you do that is by segmenting your networks. And that's the second uh, space there. Target organization didn't segment their networks appropriately. What you want is, as a defender, you want to architect your network so that there's basically blast zones where if the bad guy gets into a particular network segment, they're not able to pivot or hopscotch through your network with ease. And what you're hoping to do is create firewall rules either at the host or at the network layer or ACL rules at the routers that prevent odd network communications. And one of my favorite ones to do is actually just set up host-based firewalls because host-to-host -host communication is crazy weird and is usually an indicator that you've got very serious problems going on. All right. So uh, post-exploitation was probably the biggest section on here. Is there is there a reason for that, or is there just uh, that just something that's a favorite? No, no, that was a deliberate design choice. So post-exploitation is probably my, after reconnaissance is my second favorite phase. And the reason why is this is where what Ed and I were talking about, how you show your value as a pen tester, where you really get a chance to shine. Because now that you've got into an environment, what you should be uh, thinking about is you begin the reconnaissance phase again, and you start learning and seeing how the network's set up. Because when you're attacking or doing the reconnaissance initially, the network's going to look one way. Once you get a beachhead into an environment, things are going to look totally different. And so this phase of post-exploitation actually requires you to almost restart the entire attack life cycle again from where you are at. And so uh, quite frankly, it's really awesome because you now get to do everything all over again, but now you have some level of access. Maybe it's admin, maybe it's not, but you're now using that uh, that level of access in new and interesting ways. And if you don't believe me how fun and interesting this uh, chunk of uh, the, the penetration attack life cycle is, you really need to start uh, following people like Carlos Perez. He's got a really good blog called Shell is Only the Beginning, where he talks about how he loves to really take advantage of the post-exploitation phase and just suck the marrow out of those bones. Ed, um, I know that you go into a lot of post exploitation of 560. Um, anything that you can cover? Oh, sure. I mean, all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, plundering and pillaging uh, from the target environment is is so vital. And, and here's the big deal about post exploitation. Once you get in, what you want to do is you want to take as much information about the environment from the systems that you're currently on before you start scanning for and trying to exploit other kinds of systems. That's a really important concept. You can usually tell a junior pen tester because once they exploit one machine and they get on that box, they'll start like ping sweeping or port scanning other systems. Don't do that yet. Instead, once you get on a single machine, you analyze that machine's knowledge of its own environment. 
You should do things like dumping the ARP cache on the machine. Dump the DNS cache if it's a Windows box because it has all the, uh, the, the names and IP addresses in there that that machine has recently resolved. Do a netstat-na on that Windows box and look for established TCP connections to other systems because you know that port is open, right? Because it's got an established connection to it. You didn't need to do a port scan. You just dumped a list of TCP ports connections from the box that you compromised to other systems. So plundering that machine's knowledge of its environment allows you in a fairly innocuous way, less likely to get noticed, learn more about the rest of the networked environment there. It's a, it's a powerful thing, and uh, we spend a lot of time on that in 560. So uh, one thing to mention about that is uh, there's uh, another SANS instructor, uh, Derek Rook, and he talks about this in a really elegant way. He calls it packet economy. Once you get on a machine, every packet that you send from that beachhead, from that toehold you have in their environment, every packet that you send out, they could the defenders could detect you. So what you need to do is suck as much information as you can from that machine, like the DNS cache, the ARP cache, so that you can learn about the network, and that saves you from even having to send out any traffic. You already know those machines are there, and so your packet economy is greater. Right, well said. And then the final phase, uh, reporting. I. One of the things, I wanted to give this more space than I think the average person probably would want. But reporting, um, we keep coming across that not as many people know about reporting as they should, or they, they like everything, but when they get to reporting, that's like the least favorite part. But I wanted to put a lot of reporting on here because this is where you show the business value and the, and the reason for the pen test in the first place. So uh, Mick, is there something on here that you would like to, to emphasize? Yeah, I want to highlight the notes being well written and easy to follow. That is where I see the junior versus more seasoned pen testers. The juniors tend to get, for lack of a better term, they get blood drunk or exploit drunk. And they're having fun, they're taking over systems, they're moving throughout the network, but they're not taking good notes. And then when it comes time to write the report, they're like, oh, what? Where did I go? How did I, what, what relationship did I abuse? How did I make this work? And so what you need to do is slow down, take better notes. And frankly, it's something that I'm trying to get better at myself. It's, it's a very difficult thing to do to go slower when you're trying to make every second count during a pen test. A lot of times these engagements are only a week, which is not nearly enough time in my opinion. But by going slower, you can better understand what relationships are there. And you can also, um, when inspiration strikes and you need to move to a, a different uh, target or a different technique, you know what you were doing and you can go back to where, where you were now on your uh, task list much better. And um, Taking better notes is, I think, something we as an industry can get a lot better at. And um, one thing that I find interesting is that there's a plethora of tools out there now that are trying to help augment this. And um, what I would encourage you to do as a pen tester is go out and test different tools, test different techniques for making these notes, because frankly, it's what separates the pros from the noobs. That's right. That's right. And, and one thing that I found really useful in taking adequate notes and just kind of slowing myself down to make sure that I'm seeing what's happening and recording what's happening is screenshots. I think they go hand in hand with the notes that Mick was just describing. And we have several of the, uh, the blocks here that talk about screenshots, right? Um, and one of the things I explained to the guys on my team, this was maybe a year ago, and shame on me for not saying it sooner, but I take the screenshots while I do the pen test, of course, and... Then when I'm going to work on my report, the screenshots become kind of the tent poles of the report. And then I write the text to kind of connect the tent poles together. And I, I mentioned this and a couple of guys on my team said, wow, that's a really neat way of doing it. And I thought to myself, I've never actually considered any other way of doing it. How else would you do it? You take the screenshots, they're your tent poles, then you write the connective tissue between them. And um, everything just works out better. It's a much more efficient way to do it. 
And uh, the other big tip on this one is writing a little bit of your report every day. So take your screenshots, that's all very good and such, but you don't want to have to like take two weeks of work and then spend another three or four or five or six days writing a report on it. Instead, write a little bit of your report every day and the report will be better. Take your screenshots every day and dump them into your report and then work on the connective tissue. It's just gonna make for a better report. And I know a lot of people don't like to do pen test reporting. I'll tell you a little secret. I don't like to do pen test reporting, but you got to do it because it is where the business value comes from. It's like what Jason just said. This is where you drive that business value and show that you did a great job. So it's, it's vital. So uh, I'm going to let you two in on a secret of what this poster was, you know, for me is that uh, when I first came to SANS and came to, you know, this curriculum, I didn't understand penetration testing uh, because I was coming from a comic book and filmmaking background, you know, I work marketing. So when I got here, uh, I had Ed Scotus to to explain to me what penetration testing is, and I don't think everyone has an Ed Scotus unless they have this webcast. Um, so this poster for you who are listening and the people who hang this up in their office is a way for you to show people who may not know what penetration testing is to show them the phases, show them the tools, and show them the methodology to take them through from the beginning all the way to the end and, and how this all works together. And so, you know, essentially I, I made my own cheat sheet for what pen testing is and for you to share with others. And that's what the poster became. Yeah. All right. So uh, on the back, we already talked a little bit about Shodan and the Google dorks. This jumps into some of the information. So it's, it's kind of a cheat sheet if you have it up just to remind you that these things exist and that you can go deeper in with uh, the notes themselves. Um, but I did want to get over here to Hashcat. So when you get an opportunity, uh, these uh, PowerPoint slides are available and you'll be able to download them from the sans.org slash webcast uh, page and you'll be able to go in and get these. But if you want, uh, we have this password cracking uh, webcast that John Gorenflow did back in September 13th that you can use. And this is where all that information that he was using for that came together for this cheat sheet that you can also download this page as its own individual PDF, so you can use it that way. Um, Mick, did you have anything to add to this? Well, I just want, if you haven't played with Hashcat or even John the Ripper, you owe it to yourself to do so. Many organizations don't realize just how powerful these tools are, and a lot of our password policies that organizations are using are based off of antiquated notions of just how much compute power attackers can bring to bear. Um, some buddies of mine made a rig specifically for the Crack Me If You Can uh, challenge that happens every year at DEF CON. And in 2015, so a little over three years ago now, they built a password cracking rig that could do 92.3 billion password guesses a second. And under that kind of onslaught, most corporate and government password policies will just melt. So you need to test these tools and play around with them and just get comfortable with them because the bad guys are using these. So, uh, Ed, I have a quick plug for KringleCon. Uh, yes. John came back and did an intro to Hashcat webcast that's about 12 minutes long that if you do a search for KringleCon and Hashcat, you'll find that um, from John. And it is a great introduction to Hashcat from downloading it to you know, impl implementing the uh, all the tools here that you see on the left. All right, so Ed, we have this Netcat cheat sheet, and this is something that's been around for some time, but we hadn't put it into print form like this. Uh, it is available as a two-page PDF that you can download from our blog. And I just wanted to, to put in here and, and then ask you a few questions. But if you go to sans.org slash board game, it will take you to a web page that has uh, a PDF that you can download. But then it goes into some of the supplemental materials here, like we have a Metasploit, Netcat, Nmap, Python 3, Scapy, and PowerShell cheat sheet. And these come from uh, your class, Ed, from the 560 course. How do you utilize these cheat sheets um, to do what you do? So they're very handy um, because you know the, the syntax of some of these tools is it not trivial, not easy. So having the cheat sheets, you know, in a written format, 
sitting right next to your computer, you can refer to these things. We do it in a class all the time. And honestly, I find myself by having the cheat sheets, I use them for a little while and then it aids as a memory tool. I can remember things better once it's on a cheat sheet so that eventually I don't have to look at the cheat sheet anymore. So the cheat sheet lets you kind of cheat, right? It gives you the hints while you're working on it. And then after you use it for a while, you just start remembering the things better. So I find them almost like a, kind of like training wheels when you're trying to ride a bicycle, right? These cheat sheets really help you as you build your pen testing skills. And we've got them for like the most common and powerful attack tools that you'll use in a pen test. Like Netcat, you use Netcat all the time. Or Metasploit, fantastic stuff. Nmap, there's a cheat sheet from the 573 course for uh, Python 3. We've got one in 560 for Scapy and another one for PowerShell. So I find the cheat sheets to be tremendously helpful learning tools. And uh, I hear the same thing from a lot of the students. They like them. We not only give them to students in the classes in paper form, um, but there's also electronic form as well. And you can go to the SANS website and uh, download the electronic form of most of our cheat sheets, which is pretty cool. So, so um, that's pretty much it. Uh, this is a reminder that you can download the PDF here. Um, and then we do have questions. Ed, I'm going to jump into the questions part, and I know that you don't have an exact answer for this, but since it's on the poster and people are asking, when is Slingshot going live? So um, we had just had a meeting at CDI uh, last week to discuss uh, the status of Slingshot, and uh, the team is working on it. Right now they're focused on KringleCon. Uh, once it's done, uh, we will have a downloadable version of Slingshot for folks. And uh, for the people who are listening who may not know, because they haven't gotten the poster yet, what is Slingshot? So Slingshot is a Linux distribution uh, that we use in several of the uh, SANS pen test courses. Um, and uh, it includes a variety of different tools. And people ask all the time, well, how does it differ from Kali? Um, it has fewer tools than Kali. Kali's got a lot of stuff in it, and Kali's a, a great distribution. But what we've done is we've, we've tested and tested and tested. Each tool has been carefully tested carefully configured to ensure that it works really reliably, especially for the SANS labs that the tool is featured in, but also in, in more general pen testing. So uh, for everyone listening right now, a couple things. One, if you have suggestions for future webcast and future posters or future cheat sheets, feel free to add them into the questions window. We'd love to have your suggestions for future things. Um, the other thing, is um, what you thought of the poster. And, and I wanted to let you know that we are taking everyone who's registered for this webcast up until the end of today. So today is December 19th, 2018. If you're watching the recording, this does not count for you. And I apologize for that. We just don't have a way to fill that at this time. But anyone who's listening and has registered now up until the end of today, December 19th, 2018, we will be mailing you three printed copies of this poster to the mailing address that you have on your SANS portal account or your SANS community account. So uh, if you have any questions or that, uh, feel free to send it. Uh, I have some people responding now saying, yay, uh, does this include Europe? This does include Europe. Uh, this includes anyone who registered. Uh, it might take you longer to get them in Europe and in Asia Pacific region, uh, but we are planning to mail those out if we have a valid mailing address. If we don't, then they come back to our office and then I get emails about it saying, Jason, what are all these? So, um, but if you have questions, uh, feel free to ask them now. Uh, Mick, I, I have one question for you. Um, with When coming out with uh, this poster and uh, the landing spaces, uh, was there anything that you left out that you wish you could have added, but you didn't have space for? Wow. <laughs> there, there was so much that had to be left out. Um, I'm actually going to cheat on that question, though, a little bit. One of the things that is, uh, I, I don't know how we could make this work in the game, but the issue is, on a real pen test, you're actually going to be going sequentially through each square. So... I don't want you to think after playing this game that you can, you know, because we did this particular square or this sequence, we can skip the squares that we would have gone over if you rolled anything over a one. You can't do that. One of the things that's tedious about pen testing is 
every little step builds on the prior one. So you have to put that time in. And that's probably the biggest regret that I have in the game. But that wouldn't make it really a game. That would just be a, a lot less fun. Right. So a uh, question for you. What tools do you recommend for taking notes? Like general meeting recording tools like AudioNote or something more specific for pen testers? Well, it depends on what you're familiar with. Um, I, I know this sounds odd, but I'm seeing more and more uh, pen testers actually using things like Microsoft's OneNote, where yep. they'll start a new workbook and they'll just, you know, take a screenshot, like Ed said, they'll paste the screenshot in and put a little short sentence fragment of, I did this, here's the result. Um, so, you know, there there are plenty of other uh, tools out there. There's... Um, you know, but don't think that you have to do something really crazy and exotic in order to do this. It's more right. about recording what you're doing. Yep. So there's, I mean, there's a variety of things like Evernote and OneNote. One thing that worries me a little bit is the sensitivity of the data that pen testers are gathering and then pushing it up into OneNote or Evernote's cloud. Um, if that were to be compromised, that would be really bad news. So make sure you're using at least two-factor authentication. Um, being very careful with the details of what you mention in your notes if you're going to store them on a cloud-based service. Alternatively, you could store things locally, of course, uh, or configure uh, OneNote so that it's just doing all stuff from your local file system. Um, but be sensitive to that. These are this is really important information in your notes. Um, you know, some people just store stuff in just a plain old text file. Um, like Mick said, it, it doesn't have to be fancy. There are some great, you know, pen testing. Uh, sort of uh, organizing tools, things like uh, Layer um, from the folks at Optive. Uh, it's, it's a free tool that you can use to import things from your scanning tools and you can add notes to it and, and more. There's also you know, some of the capabilities of the commercial version of Metasploit for integrating notes into the Metasploit database. So there's a lot of different things that you could use there like Layer or Metasploit Pro, but like Mick said, it doesn't have to be fancy. Not at all. One other thing, uh, if I may, um, Ed mentioned about the sensitivity of the data. If you're a pen tester and you find a sensitive data store, please be careful how you interact with it. If you can find, say, a SQL injection and it allows you to pull all the rows of credit card information, don't do that. Don't pull back the rows of data. Just do a select count to prove that you have the ability to see the data but don't actually touch that data. You need to start thinking of sensitive data as being radioactive. And you wouldn't, well, most people wouldn't like go, oh, hey, cool glowing glue, goo and pick it up and start playing with it. So don't do that. I've actually got uh, friends who became uh, in scope for the next PCI audit because they grabbed PCI protected data. So just try and be mindful. You can show that you had access without actually stealing the data or displaying the data in other means. All right. Uh, how can you Google Dork routinely without getting your IP banned? Oh, uh, honestly, that's where the paid API access starts coming in because mm -hmm. there's, there's no uh, good free way to do that that I'm aware of, Ed. Do you? No, have... I mean, it comes down to throttling to make sure you don't go too fast. Yeah. And, um, you know, tools like Search Diggity and such can throttle for you. But by definition, throttling is going to slow you down. Um, so if you want to go the free way, it's just going to go slower for you. Um, so someone said, looking at the game, uh, at the board game, uh, should there be a spot for turning into an incident response mode? <laughs> well, uh. that, you know, we do talk about that in 560. You know, let's say you get into a machine, you start looking around. And you realize the machine has been compromised before you by somebody else, some bad <laughs> person in there. I call that pre-owned. The box is pre-owned. Um, and what happens then is you stop your pen test. You report that you found evidence of an attack. And then it's very likely that the situation will turn into incident response mode. It's also, for most pen testers, unlikely that you will handle that incident. It will usually be turned over to someone else. Um, but if you're in a smaller shop, and you wear many hats, it's possible that you're going to go from pen tester to become incident handler and then maybe digital forensics expert after that. 
But for most pen tests, once you find that it's pre-owned, that's a stop and a hard stop, which kind of brings the game to an end. Um, and therefore, that's not super uh, exciting from a board game perspective. <laughs> but yeah, maybe a reference to that saying, hey, you, you've been hacked or you found that the, the target system has already been hacked. Um, go back two places or something. Also, depending on how uh, the community support for this game goes, maybe that's a new game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, had a thought on building a cracking rig versus using something like cloud-based systems for cost savings. You want to go first, Mick, or shall I? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Um, so it depends on how often you're going to be doing the cracking. For most organizations, unless you're doing cracking all the time, it may make sense to just do that cloud-based. Now, again, with what Ed was saying about sensitivity of stuff in the cloud, you need to be very mindful of that. Also, this is a little embarrassing, but I once wrote a script that did cloud-based cracking, and I had a little math logical error in mind. And instead of spinning up X number of machines to do the cracking, I did X times 100 machines. Now, we cracked the hashes very quickly, but Amazon was delighted to give me a X times 100 bill. So just be careful with that. Math is hard. Math is hard. I don't like to do it in the cloud myself because of the security uh, issues that Mick has already brought up. Um, but uh, that said, if you want to throw a lot of resources at it, it gets very expensive. Very expensive. Uh, go GPU, of course, and probably use a tool like Hashcat because it has a solid GPU integration. But double check to make sure your given multi GPU environment is supported by Hashcat before you make your purchase. Triple check because I've been bit by that. There's times that it's very specific to which revision of the, the card, and it's, it's painful when you've spent yep. as much as the cards go for now. And yeah. you know, another tip. Another tip there is try to buy your uh, your cards. Make sure they're compatible. But you could buy them used from uh, frustrated crypto miners uh, who decided they can't afford enough electricity to to actually make it worth their while anymore. So they're trying to dump their GPUs. <laughs> so that's a little tip there. Look on eBay for for crypto miners trying to get rid of GPUs. Huh. Uh, two quick follow up questions. First one: uh, Will Slingshot be a preloaded VM or an ISO? Uh, preloaded VM. Okay. And then uh, another follow-up is, what was the name of the software from Optiv again that was mentioned? Layer, L-A-I-R, like welcome to my layer. Okay. Uh, multiple people have asked for a blue team version of the poster, so uh, that is something to think about. And then we also got a suggestion for how to write a proper pen test report as a future webcast, and I think that's a really great idea. Ah, very good. Um, I um I've done some webcasts where th that's like a little part of the webcast. I did one uh, a few years ago. It was a, a keynote at DerbyCon called "How to Give the Best Pen Test of Your Life," and about I'd say ten or twelve minutes of that webcast are devoted to or, uh, of that presentation, which you can watch as a webcast, are devoted to uh, tips on making your reports awesome. So, so um. We don't have enough time to get to any more questions, but if you do have them, feel free to hit us up on Twitter. As you can see, our names are there. Uh, you can also leave comments on the YouTube page that we'll get to when we have the time. And then, uh, Ed, any final words about today's webcast and the poster? No, I, I just want to thank you for organizing it, uh, Jason. It's really cool of you. Thank you for sending those uh, posters out to all of our attendees. I'd like to thank Mick for his great work on the poster. He uh, he started the, his presentation today on the poster talking about how it was a big blank set of spaces and it said, insert cool stuff here. Mick brought the cool. That's what he brought to the poster. And uh, I think he did a great job with it. By the time uh, Jason presented the idea to me, then went to Mick to kind of fill in the, the spaces. By the time it came to me, I had a couple of suggestions here, tweaks this way and that way. But Mick, my hat's off to you, buddy. You did a great job. Well, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And Mick, any final words from you? Well, uh, folks, go out, get this poster, play with it, let us know what you think. We hope that this helps you learn. I certainly learned a lot in writing this poster, and we look forward to helping the community get better. This is a team effort, so let us know what you're struggling with, and we'll be happy to give additional webinars or cheat sheets or whatever you need to be successful. And I would say my last words are, uh, please, if you use this and you're in a place where you could take a picture of it, 
if you could take a photo and put it on Twitter and tag us in that post, what we then do is we take that to our senior leaders and we say this stuff is being used, it's being, uh, it is useful to the community, and then they let us make more of it. And so you would be able to help us make more content like this by showing that you're using it, and we would really appreciate that. And with that, I will turn it over to Carol to finish today's webcast. Thank you all very much for tuning in. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Jason, Ed, and Mick for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time in 2019, take care. And we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.